Turn with me please to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's page 185. And we're going to be thinking a bit about these words. Perhaps if you want, you can stand. Uh, we're only going to be reading nine verses, uh, but if you want to stretch, then be happy to stand. And we're going to read Deuteronomy chapter 6, and I'm going to begin at verse 1. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you're crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and, your, and, your, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the land, flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Well, this is the word of the living God. I'm sure you've read that before you've recognized the words that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul with all your strength because we read it when we were looking at our passage in Luke just now and um, yes yeah, sorry children um, I, I was given a very clear instruction don't forget Sunday school I'll write it down here next time um, but what we've just been reading, um, if you were Jewish, you would know these words off by heart. They're the words of the Shema, or some of the words, the opening words. Um, and literally now, Orthodox Jews uh, will, if they are extremely pious, they will have um, the words that we've just read, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your strength. And... Uh, the words from Leviticus that you must love your neighbour as yourself, they will have those words written on paper and they'll be put in a little box and they'll wear them literally around their foreheads. And they'll have some of the other words written and they'll be in a little box on their arm because the scripture says, talk about them, uh, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. And so um, those who are particularly pious Jews literally have those words when they go to worship um, during the week interestingly not on their sabbath i don't know why uh, but when they go to worship during the week they will have the phylacteries on their heads and that's the, the sort of person that we're reading about in uh, luke chapter 10. Um, but i wonder if i can take you back a little way uh, to um, reading bedtime stories to your children. Perhaps some of you still do, I don't know. Um, usually they wanted a different story to the one that you intended to read. Um, and then there was that story that they asked for seemingly every day, every day. Uh, at one time I could recite the enormous turnip word perfect without opening the book. They pulled and pulled with all their might, but they could not pull up the enormous turnip. Um, and you can recite those, can't you? You don't have to open the book. But that's okay, because while you're reading on autopilot, you can think about something else. The jobs you need to get done uh, before you can sit down, the stuff you need to get ready for tomorrow. How can you get to the tip tomorrow? 
uh, if you've got to do this and you've got to do that. You know, you've been there, you've had the, the, those occasions. And, and you find yourself thinking so hard, oh, sorry Rob, so hard about uh, what you're doing tomorrow and you're reading on autopilot that you just finish. And, and you sit there, thinking still, until your kids, Dad! And then, oh, sorry, I've finished and I'm thinking about something else. It can happen, can't it? It can happen like that when you're really, really familiar with a story. And I guess when I read the story of the Good Samaritan with you just now, you might have drifted into one of those chuck trances thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow. I should actually have made you stand up while I was reading that passage rather than Deuteronomy, shouldn't I? The thing is, it's a passage that we know so well. The title has even made our way into every, its way into everyday language. Everybody knows what a good Samaritan is. It's somebody who helps people. Well, I'm not sure how to stop you guys drifting into uh, a trance, because when you sit there behind a mask, you've already got a head start, haven't you? Um, but I'm going to try and get you to dig into the narrative with me, so that you can see it's much more than about just helping people. Now, it's interesting, because although this is a really well-known episode, it's only Luke that records it. And we said at the beginning of our studies, it was 30-something weeks ago, so you might not remember that far back, that Luke actually introduces us to a lot of new material that the other Gospel writers didn't have. Um, so why, it'd be worth saying, why has he introduced us to this piece of material, this particular exchange? It couldn't have been because he thought, I'm going to write this because this story is going to travel the globe. Because back then, stories of Jews and Samaritans, they must have been to a penny. You know, like when I grew up, um, the jokes about the Irishman and the Welshman, and the Englishman and Irishman and Scotsman went into a pub. There were hundreds and hundreds. We're not allowed to do those now, but back then, able to do loads. So you wouldn't, in the 60s or 70s, have said, oh, this is special. So in just the same way, Luke wouldn't have said, oh, I must get this down. It's a, it's a story of a Jew and a Samaritan. They would to a penny. So why has he put this in? Well, the clue, of course, is going back to why Luke wrote his gospel. You might remember that he says right at the beginning of chapter one, I decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you've been taught. And, and when we looked at that, um, and in the first week of our studies in Luke, um, we interpreted it like this. We said, Luke wrote his gospel to teach us the great truths about Jesus. So, what we need to do as we approach the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10, is we need to keep that objective in mind and ask what truth, what great truth about Jesus is being taught here. Now it all starts with a seemingly innocent and very important question. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's a super question, sadly asked with a wicked motivation. The guy asking it, verse 25 tells us, wanted to test Jesus. The man was an expert in the Jewish law of the kind that I described to you just now. He would have his phylactery certainly on his forehead on certain occasions because he was very devout and he knew his law. But he was probably one of a group of men who just wanted to make Jesus look stupid. But Jesus, as he often did, answered a question with another question. Verse 26, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. The man was right. He was quoting his Bible. For generations, these words had been committed to memory by Jewish children and still are. Then comes the knockdown blow from Jesus, verse 28. You've answered correctly, Jesus said. Do this and you will live. 
Now, you'll have noticed that on occasions the Bible is, is sparing in detail. And I think this is one of those times because uh, cocky lad starts out with a question that he thinks is going to prove difficult for Jesus and he's going to be able to say to all his mates down the pub tonight, oh, did you see how I put that guy in the corner? But Jesus turned the tables and got the man to answer himself. And he must have been squirming inside because he realised that devout as he was, skilled as he was in the law, he hadn't done enough to get into heaven. Because there's the standard, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbour as yourself. And he knew he hadn't done that. He knew he could never love God or his neighbour perfectly, so his own lips had condemned him. But he wasn't going quietly. He might have lost the argument, but he could make, still make Jesus look daft. So, verse 29, he, he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbour? Now notice again, this isn't the continuation of a genuine person asking a question of eternal significance. This is a man looking to trick Jesus and look good. And another way of, the law, uh, uh, of considering the lawyer's question would be, teacher, whom do I not have to love? Once again, Jesus won't be taken in. He simply tells a story, and at the end of it, he says, so which of these was a neighbour? He puts the ball right back uh, in the lawyer's court. And the story, you know, I'm going to rush through it because uh, it's, a, it's a lovely story, but it's a quick one to understand. There's a man going down from uh, Jerusalem to Jericho. It was a long, steep, downward journey of about 17 miles. It would have been a good, hard day's walk, and it was bandit territory. On his way, the guy is mugged and left badly beaten. But it was a busy road. He was, he'd be okay because Jericho was known as the city of priests. And so they would go up to do their tour of duty. They would, uh, they would serve uh, in the temple and then they'd come back down uh, the same road um, back home to Jericho. And so there was always holy men going up and down this road. That's why Jesus told the story as he did. And sure enough, in our story, a priest soon comes along and so help is at hand. You know the story, not so. The priest saw the guy lying in the road, so he swiftly sidestepped and walked past the poor man. Not long after, says Jesus, a Levite comes along. So you think, oh, perhaps the priest's assistant will have more um, time and uh, compassion than his boss. Not so. He too stepped to one side so that he could walk past the poor fellow. Two holy men. There's nothing, of course, holy about their behaviour, was there? Then, says Jesus, a Samaritan came along. And I'd never thought about this, but think about it. I bet the listeners now are holding their breath because they know what Jesus is going to say. He's going to say, the Samaritan put the boot in and spat on him because he hates Jews. But not so. The Samaritan stopped and without the modern antiseptics that we have, he took a le his leather bottle of wine, poured that onto the man's wounds to uh, start to attack any sepsis. Next, olive oil to start the healing process, and then bandage. The man's beating had been so severe that he would be unable to continue his journey for a while, so the guy puts, the Samaritan puts him on his donkey, walks beside so that when, and when the donkey sways too much, he just makes sure the guy doesn't fall off. At the next inn, he found the man a bed. He made certain he had something to eat and drink. Do you notice? that actually it tells us in the scriptures that he cared for him. He, he looked after him there. And then the next morning he paid the innkeeper enough to keep him for around seven to ten days and promised to settle up next time if the man had to stay longer. Now the listening crowd would have been 
listening intently and they would have been incredulous because Jews and Samaritans never had any dealings with each other and this Samar for the Samaritan to do anything like this was wow it was incredible um, but when the lawyer had to respond to Jesus's question which of the three was a neighbor I wonder if you've noticed the lawyer couldn't even bring himself to say the word or the name Samaritan that was the obvious answer who, who, who was the neighbor well the Samaritan no 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 the one who had verse 37 the one who had mercy on him he would not even say the name Go and do likewise, says Jesus. Game over, retreat of man, tail between legs, never to be heard of again. It's a super story. It's one that the kids in Sunday school could probably have taught me through because we, we teach them at a very young age. But what great truth about Jesus is being taught here? Or perhaps what great truths we pluralize it are being taught here well we have to link back don't we to one of the learning points from last week because uh, when we are here Sunday after Sunday if we start to see themes we have to pick them up we have to acknowledge them and remember we said this last week we said God puts us where he wants us to serve we said God has put you in a job community street for a purpose there will be precious few believers where you're located and we believe quite firmly in a god of design rather than chance don't we god put you there to be salt and light to those around you so in effect we were saying last week god has chosen your neighbors for you fast forward to this week how are we to treat our neighbors says the scriptures in the words of Deuteronomy uh, and Leviticus, we are to love them as much as we love ourselves. In the words of this story, we are to behave as the Good Samaritan did. Now, of course, this isn't easy, is it? Because <laughs> we might not like our neighbours. It's interesting. The, uh, the Shema, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and so on. In the Old Testament... The religious leaders had downgraded the Shema from love your neighbour as yourself to love other Jews as yourself. And even then the Pharisees had downgraded it to love the local Pharisee. But you can't downgrade scripture. Nobody's allowed to do that. And Jesus introduced the Jew and Samaritan conflict precisely to show that it isn't okay to say that I will love the people who are like me. I don't think I've ever quoted G.K. Chesterton in a sermon before, but I'm going to now because he puts it like this, I think, very helpfully. We make our friends, we make our enemies, but God makes our next door neighbour. The duty towards humanity may often take the form of some choice which is personal or even pleasurable. You get that, don't you? I mean, so you do stuff for the food bank. Uh, you might buy, if you ever go into town, you might buy, um, oh, what's the magazine? Um, the Big Issue. You might buy The Big Issue. Uh, you might even go and volunteer somewhere because the duty towards humanity may often take the form of some choice which is personal or even pleasurable. But we have to love our neighbour, Chesterton says, simply because he is there. He is the sample of humanity which God has actually given us. And for neighbour, read family members as well. But you say, surely the Samaritan was, he was an exceptional man. Jesus told that story to show he was exceptional. And Jesus was talking to a religious expert. I can't be expected to love like that, can I? But that's Jesus' standard, isn't it? That's God's standard. Love your neighbour as yourself. God's command assumes, in the first instance, that you love yourself. Now, all men and women love themselves. Not in the sense 
that they're big-headed or totally self-obsessed, although many are. Not in the sense of having a good self-image or feeling especially happy about oneself, although many are. Loving yourself means simply desiring and seeking one's own good. And God's standard is that we should desire and seek the good of others always, which means that we will end up putting ourselves second nearly all of the time. And that's a really high bar, isn't it? That's a very high bar. How on earth can you achieve that? Well, you can't, not on your own. But my friend in Christ, you are a new creation. The cross of Christ isn't simply an example of incredible love for our neighbour, that the fact that Jesus was prepared to die, it's not just a, an example of incredible love. The cross of Christ is what transforms your life. God has made us new creatures in Christ, righteous before him and empowered to love others for his sake. Ephesians 2 uh, you'll know verse 8 very well, for it's by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God. Verse 9, not by works, so that no one can boast. Verse 10 is not so well known. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 affects the way we see people around us, not because they've become something different, but because we have. God's work in us both justifies us and transforms us. He makes us right, it makes us right in his eyes, and it makes us new individuals. He changes the believer. God changes the believer so much. And that is because in advance, he's prepared a pathway of good works for us to do. That's what the scripture tells us. We're created in Christ Jesus. What for? To do good works. Really? Yes, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's what the scripture tells us. And so that means that on that pathway of good works, there are real people with real lives full of real stories. And now when we encounter them, they are God's call to us to be ambassadors for him, to be faithful ambassadors as we serve those who come across our paths. I don't think we can draw any other conclusion than that when we look at God's word. We have to be faithful ambassadors of Christ as we serve all of those who come across our path. Somebody, uh, when I was just doing a bit of reading around the subject, said words, I didn't write it down, but words to the effect that real Christians can't stop and question whether or not to have compassion on someone. Real Christians can't stop and question whether to have compassion on someone. They just have to. They just have to. It's, an, it's, it's almost a knee-jerk response for a Christian to have compassion because of how Christ has changed us. But we have to press on because there's an even bigger lesson for us. And it starts with the inquiry from the religious expert. Verse 25, teacher, he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And that is a super question, isn't it? We would all acknowledge that it is the question for anybody to ask in this life. How do I get to heaven? And Jesus' answer is extremely interesting. He effectively says to the guy, you know. And of course he does. He knows Deuteronomy 6, which we read earlier, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. He knows Leviticus 19, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbour as yourself. 
want to have eternal life, want to go to heaven, all you have to do is keep God's law perfectly and you'll be there. You know that, Jesus says, just keep the law. The problem is, as this guy clearly knows, we can't do that. No one but Jesus has ever done that. But here's the real problem in this story, in this true, this is not the story, this is, this is true narrative. This really happened between Jesus and the man. Don't confuse it with the story of the Samaritan. And in this true story, this young guy, or old guy, rather than confess his failings, he tries to justify himself. Hence the who is my neighbour question. He's clutching at straws here, but he's hoping, he's hoping that Jesus is going to say, do good to those who are like you. You don't have to do good to them. You don't have to do, do good to those who are like you. But of course, the, of course, that's nowhere near good enough, is it? And of course, it fails to consider the first bit of the law, to love God. Well, what should he have done when Jesus said, you know the answer? What should he have done? Well, in Acts chapter 16, we read about a man, a jailer, who understood that he could never hit God's standards. But rather than try to argue himself into heaven, instead of debating the scriptures, he simply cried out to Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Now, we meet lots of people, don't we, today, like the religious expert? Could be that, that you're one of them. Not wanting to acknowledge that you failed completely to keep God's law. You prefer instead to argue the toss. Arguing the toss doesn't change anything. And the guy in the narrative knows it, and we know it, really, in our heart of hearts. But it is a key question, how do I get to heaven? The jailer in Acts chapter 16 got it right. He acknowledged his hopelessness and cried out to God, what must I do? He recognised his position. He didn't attempt to justify himself. He threw himself on God's mercy. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 tells us, God made him who had no sin that's Jesus, to be sin for us. Why? So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And that is the heart of the Christian message. That's the gospel, that Jesus allowed himself to be punished for our sin, so that we could avoid the punishment. The religious expert in Luke 10 chose to argue and debate that he was not a sinner. The jailer knew that he was. The religious expert crept away silently and, as far as we know, never came to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. The jailer that very night put his trust in Jesus and he knew the joy of having sins forgiven. And along with that, a certain place in heaven. The religious leader didn't get the place in heaven that he was talking about. The jailer most certainly did. Surely we have to ask ourselves this afternoon, which of these two men we're like? But we must close our time as gone. We said, what great truth is being taught here about Jesus? Well, it is important, it is important that we think about the Good Samaritan and how he is a model for us to treat all those who come across our path. It's important for us to think that. But, but, we must never lose sight of the fact that the central issue, the central, the core of this particular story has to do with how the cross of Christ changes us totally. God has made us new creatures in Christ. First, we become righteous in God's eyes, which never ceases to amaze me. 
first we become righteous in God's eyes and we're assured of a place in heaven, which is a great joy. And then we are empowered to love others, even those that we find difficult. And we're empowered to love others for his sake. We're only doing the works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. Well, we must leave it there. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. Many of us know the Good Samaritan story really well. We've known it since we were children, some of us. And yet, Father, we are just uh, reminded again that we can't ever behave in such a way that we can earn our place into heaven. We just can't love people as much as we should. And we certainly don't love you as much as we should. And so, Father, without the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be totally and completely lost. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his cross. We began the service thanking you for the cross of Christ. We finish it thanking you for the cross of Christ. We praise you for your goodness and for your care for us. Father, thank you for this word. Will you apply it to our hearts, Lord? Some of us need, need to hear it and, and to learn about behaving in a better way towards others who are different. Some of us need to hear it and to be reminded it's only being made different, only having our hearts changed by the Lord Jesus Christ that allows us to do anything. And some of us need to hear it and come to Christ for the first time because we just don't like the fact that we're called sinners. And so we argue the toss. But as we've seen this afternoon, arguing the toss doesn't change anything. If we haven't trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour, if we haven't asked you, Holy God, to forgive us because Christ has died on our behalf, and we're just like that uh, expert in the law. We're just arguing, 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 and we could end up walking away from you and never knowing you. Lord, that would be a dreadful, dreadful thing. We pray that if there's any this afternoon who are watching online at a later stage who don't know Christ as their saviour, you will work in their hearts and in their minds and draw them to him. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the, uh, the fellowship that we'd love to enjoy, but we probably can't really now. Uh, we pray again for our leaders, Lord, that the vaccine that uh, we've been hearing so much about this weekend will really be something that changes the face of uh, this disease. We pray, Lord, that in the interim you will give us uh, the grace to bear with all the stuff that's going on and help us not to ignore fellowship with each other. And Lord, may we be your ambassadors to anybody who comes across our path particularly those who are really, really struggling with, uh, with lockdown or COVID. May we have just the right words to encourage them and turn their eyes to Jesus. Would you lead us through this coming week? Would you watch over us in our families, in our jobs, uh, in the circumstances that we find ourselves? Father, would you keep our eyes on Jesus? And Lord, we look forward to meeting again on the Lord's day. Uh, in seven days. Lord, bring us back safely. Together we pray. Lord, we ask all these things in and through the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.